All right. Good morning, traders. My name is Christopher Vecchio, Senior Currency Strategist with Daily FX. Today is Monday, July 24th, 2017. I'm here to take you through the uh, FX Week Ahead strategy session over the next 30 minutes or so. I do appreciate everyone's patience here at the beginning of the session, how to straighten out a few things before we can get started. Um, if I can get a quick confirmation that audio and video are now up and working, I had a little bit of a concern earlier, um, but if you could just give me a confirmation why or yes in the chat box, I will know now and we will be good to go. You can see my screen and hear my voice as we look to kick things off. Yes, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. And again, I appreciate your patience here. As always, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to put them in the chat box at any point in time. If you're looking for trade-specific insight, please include your entry stop and time frame. That way I know where you've gotten into the market, where your risk lies, and of course, what your point of view is. Beyond that, please be aware any opinion I disseminate is mine and mine alone and does not constitute trade advice on behalf of daily effects or IEG group, so please don't treat it as such. All right, um, with that said, uh, dollar index is sitting at its yearly lows or right off of it as we start this week, trading in at 93.97 right now. Uh, moving below that August swing low in 94.08 that we established back on August uh, eight, uh, 18th, excuse me, 2016. So um, as it were, if the dollar doesn't begin to stabilize down here, we're starting to probe the lows that we've seen over the last two years, um, that to me would be pointing to the next swing level lower, which was pre-Brexit last June. June 23rd comes down at 93.02, perhaps the next big level in DXY. But as we approach the start of this week here, um, ultimately we're looking at a week where there are several significant U.S. economic data releases. And there are several important events and data releases actually across the world. Euro, uh, the euro is probably taking a back seat this week, as is the Canadian dollar to an extent. Um, we're seeing that not much significant European economic data is on the calendar, uh, while there's a lot more U.S., a lot more uh, Japanese, Australian, um, what have you. Uh, so if we're going to take a look at the calendar here, we're going to filter out all of the low-rated events as well as the medium-rated ones. We're going to flip on over to Weekly View to see where our high-rated events fall this week. We do have U.S. Consumer Confidence tomorrow on Tuesday, although I would say that given the context of all the data this week, this is probably not the highest-rated event on the calendar. I think that there are several other events that are worth paying closer attention to. While it is considered a high-rated event, the July U.S. Consumer Confidence reading on Tuesday um, is probably going to be the high-rated event that causes the least movement in the market over the course of the week, perhaps next to the Fed nominee confirmation hearing at the Senate Banking Committee. Um, that ends consumer confidence probably going to do the least. There's been a long-standing disconnect between sentiment readings and real economic activity of what we've called the hard and soft data divide. So the data will probably be overlooked if not dismissed by the market on Tuesday. Although U.S. equity markets are near all-time highs, consistent acrimony in Washington, D.C. has probably started to erode otherwise stellar confidence readings, which themselves are near their highest level since 2000. Uh, on Wednesday, we have Aussie consumer prices, and that's where really things get interesting for FX markets this week. Australian dollar has been on a bit of a tear recently, thanks in part to what's going on in metals markets. Copper has been on quite a tear, as has been iron ore in recent days, up again big today. So we're seeing the Australian dollar move up. For those that are unfamiliar, iron ore is the largest commodity by volume traded from Australia, exported from Australia. And so similar to the relationship that the Canadian dollar has with oil, you see that relationship play out between the Australian dollar and uh, iron ore. Uh, who would be buying iron ore? Well, China typically, because iron ore is used in this steel smelting process. And so uh, iron ore is generally seen as an indicator, if you will. So same for copper, an indicator for real economic activity. You need the two for wiring, for uh, girders, for buildings, for electrical work, right? If those are going up in price, that probably means there's more demand. And if there's more demand, that means it's probably real economic growth going on roads, buildings, airports, et cetera, that use those type of raw materials. So um, Australian dollar seen as a growth proxy for emerging markets, and we're seeing that it's going up here. Uh, in turn, actually, this is a new phenomenon. So during the second quarter when we have that inflation data, it was actually a pretty rough period of time for the Australian dollar. You know, not too rough. I mean, ultimately, actually, when we take a look at how it performed during most of the quarter, 
Aussie dollar prices were down. We started the quarter off up at 75.91. We actually ended the quarter uh, going out June 30th at 76.82. But for most of the time, we were trading lower. Um, in turn, we're looking for actually a small bounce in Australian CPI uh, uh, this week. Very tiny, 2.2% from 2.1% year over year for the second quarter. Uh, this is more or less right near the RBA's target of 2%. The RBA's target is defined as a medium-term average to allow for unforeseen uh, uh, circumstances and for lags in the effects of monetary policy. Right now, inflation is being pushed higher by a little bit of a boost in commodity prices at the end of the second quarter and uh, rising domestic income and consumer expenditures. But with inflation readings still pretty low, I, you're talking about um, Q4 2016 figures, which were just uh, their lowest levels in 19 years. Interest rate hikes are still a ways away, and right now rates markets aren't pricing in anything for the Australian dollar for uh, this year. I do think that this is the low point in the cycle, however, and so if we do see that inflation readings are starting to push up, I would look to something like Aussie Yen, which has started to stabilize as perhaps the way to take advantage of uh, a bullish reaction or hawkish reaction by the Australian dollar. Uh, if you take a look at Aussie Yen over the last several weeks, going all the way back to the June 6th low, price has been rather stable in this uptrend. In fact, something uses confirmation, the 813 e daily EMA envelope. Um, since we closed above it back on June 7th, both the 8 and the 13, price has not closed below the 13 EMA. We've used this 1813 area in between as kind of a catch-all for price going back to June 15th. We've had several rallies into, but no closes below that area. Uh, and so at this point in time, seeing as how we just had this uh, two-day pullback here in Aussie Yen, it looks like now that we've come back into this key level of support, again, if we just want to take off the 8 and leave the 13 on, you can see how important this has been since June 7th. And so if we are to continue in this uptrend that we've been going on through the last almost two months, now about six and a half weeks here, uh, this is the place where price should begin to bounce. Now Aussie Yen is sitting below a key level right near 89.37, I have it marked off here on the chart. It coincides with some former lows that we saw back in February 2015 and July 2015. Uh, we, we saw back once it was broken down through, it really didn't come up as significant resistance in the way up. But needless to say, we did just pivot away from there last week, so I think that area is back into play. Uh, I think right now with price well supported by the moving averages, MACD and Stochastics continuing to point higher in their bullish territory, I think that if Aussie Yen is going to rally this week, this is the level we should look to. I'm curious to see what happens uh, if, if we do break lower from here. We do have a very clean level to work with, actually. You go back to the July 14th and the July 18th lows, and you see that the July 18th low is actually below to the July 14th low. So that's to say, if we break down below the July 18th low, that would represent a swing lower where we've ended the series of higher highs and higher lows, and that would be a warning sign in conjunction with the breakdown below that daily 13 EMA that this uptrend is over. And considering where we are right now in price at 88.07, you're talking about a move down below 87.49. This is a 60 pip stop here um, for a potential swing back higher up to 89.37, and that's about 130 pips right now. So as far as I'm concerned, if you're taking two to one on every trade um, you know, for reward to risk, then you're doing uh, something right. Um, Aussie Yen in focus on Tuesday with that or excuse me, on, <clears throat> on Wednesday uh, at 1.30 GMT. So that's actually Tuesday night in New York, Wednesday, early, early morning in Europe, Australian Q2 consumer prices. Um, also on Wednesday, which is a big day, we have UK GDP. Expected to see a decline there from 2% down to 1.7%. And, and this is really setting up what may be um, the beginning, if you will, of more sideways trading in the pound. And we've already been trading sideways for the last few weeks, maybe since the uh, middle of June. We've had a little bit more of an upward tilt, but going back to April, we haven't made much progress one way or the other. Uh, the fact of the matter is right now, though, statistically speaking, we're getting out of the area in which the pound and the Brexit vote are going to have an impact on UK data. You've already seen it in the CPI, where once we got into that June period and the correction in 
exchange rates. Uh, consumer prices fell from 2.9% to 2.6% between May and June on a year-over-year -year basis. And so when you take a look at GDP, seeing a, a moderation now that we start to get into the tractor beam of the, the Brexit pull on the year-over-year -year GDP side of things, um, it kind of makes sense that we're starting to look a little bit of a slowdown here. I would point out, though, that retail sales underpin a significant portion of uh, UK economic activity, roughly two-thirds, just like in the United States, as is the case in a lot of Western developed economies. Uh, what we're seeing there is that retail sales in the most recent reporting period, which, if I recall correctly, just came out about last week, showed us a rebound of 3% from 0.6% year over year. Uh, I think that's a really good sign for GDP. So overall, if we do see a little bit of a surprise here, which may not be terrible to, to, to do, 1.7% um, is pretty easy to beat relative to the prior. So let's say it's 1.9. Uh, year over year, that's probably the more important figure than the month over month, which is doing it 0.3% from 0.2. But let's say we do get some beats there. We get 0.4, we get you know 1.9. You see the pound rally a little bit. I think it's still a, a rally to sell ultimately in the pound. I think that the impetus for the pound rally in recent weeks has been this idea that the BOE is getting more aggressive uh, about the notion that it needs to tighten up policy thanks to what's going on with inflation. But if we do see uh, a GDP report where growth is still below 2%, it's not exactly an environment where they're going to want to be screaming higher with rates uh, and crimping economic activity. Uh, moreover, when you take a look at what's been going on in inflation, if that's the backbone of their argument that they need to raise rates, it's already started to back off the recent swing high. You know, 2.9% was the cycle high here. It's now down to 2.6%. And two of the significant factors that drove inflation higher earlier this year, the British pound exchange rate on a year-over-year -year basis due to what was going on pre-Brexit, and oil prices, those two factors have been neutralized. In fact, we're trading at 130.37 right now. We go back to last July 24th, which was a Sunday, so we'll call it the 25th. We close at 131.35, only about 100 pips higher from here. That's less than 1%. So unlike where we were, let's say, back in May when prices were literally 17 or 20 percent, depending upon what day you measured it in May or June. But you go back and the British pound was 17 to 20 percent cheaper than it was this time last year. That has a real substantial impact on you know, the cost of imported goods and, and trade figures. So um, that factor has been now erased out of the data. We're now less than 1 percent lower year over year as opposed to being you know, at a maximum around 20 percent. Then you look at something like energy prices and and compared to where we were, say, just back in February, when oil prices had doubled on a year-over-year -year basis, right? February 2016, we're at 2608. February 2017, we're through 5216. It's a big impact, 100% year-over-year gain, the energy input for inflation. Here we are today at 4608, and at this time last year, we were trading down at 4303. So we're about 7% higher than we were this time last year, no longer 100%. That's significant. And while over the next few weeks, oil is going to look a little bit better, and perhaps when we get through the July and August readings, we'll get a little bit of a bump there, thanks to how weak oil was at the end of July last year. But once we get through August, oil prices begin to stabilize, and we're looking at unchanged figures year over year. All in all, the two factors that have pushed oil, excuse me, pushed inflation readings higher in the UK and other developed economies in the first half of the year, particularly in the UK, weak pound, higher oil, both have been neutralized. So I think that even if the pound is able to rally after this GDP data, let's say it's a little bit better, let's say those retail sales filter through, I'm not convinced that it's a rally that should be bought. I think it's one that should be sold on a longer term basis because the BOE is not going to hike this year, in my opinion. And that means interest rate markets will have to disappoint. And that means they will ultimately price it out. And then the final third factor is the politics. It looks like it's possible that the Tories and the DUP alliance doesn't last that long and they go to another round of elections. You know, policies and politics aside, the main factor there would be Brexit because the clock is ticking. And when you only have a finite period of time to do something, to accomplish something, you can't really whittle it away wasting it on other things like campaigning. And so if they have to spend another four, six, eight weeks campaigning before another round of general elections at any point before March 2019, 
it's going to increase the odds of a hard Brexit dramatically. I know that there's some logic out there they're saying the pound is rallying because if Theresa May and co fail hold on to power the odds of a soft Brexit increase dramatically. I just don't see it that way. I don't see the EU giving the UK an easier time because Theresa May is gone. Uh, rather, I see the EU as saying you either have to leave the EU with or without a deal. If you don't get a deal done, then it's a hard Brexit. And if you're not going to go through with Brexit, then you're just going to stay. That's the only scenario in which I can see the pound rallying. But it's either hard Brexit or them staying. And right now, Compass points to hard Brexit for May uh, on a longer term uh, basis here. Again, that's Wednesday, UK GDP. First reading for the second quarter. Just a heads up, the preliminary UK GDP reading is published um, just over three weeks after the end of the quarter and is based on 44% of the actual data. The second estimate is released around seven and a half weeks after the end of the quarter and is based around 80% of the actual data. The third estimate is released 90 days after the quarter's end and is based around 91% of the actual data. So this first print, yes, take it you know seriously, the pound's going to move in it, but it's really that second print where we get to know what the real picture is like. So treat this as preliminary data. I don't expect much of a significant move. It's July. It's the end of July. Liquidity is lower. Trading volume is lower. It's hard to find follow-through on anything in these uh, markets right now, unless, of course, for some reason, if you're the euro. Um, flipping back over to the dollar, because on Wednesday we have the Federal Reserve rate decision. Uh, a few dollar pairs I want to run through on that. FOMC uh, is not expected to do anything on the rate side of things this week, which is not a surprise because it is an off-cycle meeting. We don't have a new set of staff, or excuse me, summary of economic projections, as the Fed calls their SEPs, and we don't have a policy press conference with Janet Yellen. So seeing as how over the last three or four years the Fed has preferred to engage in these policy decision changes when they have an opportunity to explain why they're doing so in front of cameras. Um, this being a meeting where they do not have that opportunity, I would think that they do not move on the rate side of things. And certainly, Fed funds futures markets are not pricing in a rate hike. They're not even close to it. You know, less than 15% chance looking at this week of a move. Um, instead, I think that there is a small chance, but a, a chance that they start or give a very significant indication that they're ready to start their balance sheet normalization strategy, which was outlined at the June meeting in the policy normalization principles and plans augmentation. Uh, generally speaking, right now, U.S. data performance has been lackluster and U.S. inflation expectations have slumped. And I think the market and the Fed have a pretty sizable disconnect. Fed's saying that they not only could start their balance sheet normalization soon, but they also could raise rates by the end of this year. Currently, there's only a 40.4% chance of a rate hike by December 2017. Three months ago, this was about 47%. The timing of the next hike per these Fed Funds futures contracts has been pointing to March 2018. Although in recent days, this has started to oscillate to further out of the calendar, not just from late 2000, uh, Q1 2018, but to early Q2 18 being priced in. So uh, should the Federal Reserve's July policy statement reveal the beginning of the normalization process and a reaffirmation of the desire to raise rates by the end of the year? Perhaps now market participants will be forced to confront the divergence between what the Fed is saying it wants to do and what the much more dovish market interpretation uh, currently is. If this is the case, this could be a stabilizing factor for the dollar, which has really taken it on the chin in recent weeks. The dollar may finally find a reprieve in its last swing lower. And so we're hanging around this significant level here, the August swing low last year. It looks like the June swing low could be in play. Again, that comes down near 93.02 from June 23rd, 2016. I'd be hard pressed to see declines beyond that level right now. One other thing that's working in the dollar's favor, perhaps, is the fact that the market is no longer net long the US dollar and has been building a short position against it. In fact, we're actually looking at the largest net long euro position in the market since May 2013 right now. Euro dollar this week is lacking significant drivers uh, insofar as the euro side is rather dry. There's driven CPI on Friday, but that's not really something that we're all that too concerned about, I would think. Um, more 
interested in what's going on on the uh, uh, Eurozone CPI side of things, and that's next Monday. So we'll be talking about that, unfortunately, after the fact when this webinar takes place next Monday as the data will already be released. Uh, but that's the data we really care more about. So this week, a really dry week for the euro overall. Um, chart's messy because I'm looking at a longer term basis here, but a uh, picture remains. We're, we're getting up into the top side of uh, the highs that we had back in 2015, 2016, back in that uh, August 2015, uh, May 2016 swing high period. Uh, efforts for the euro to rally up in here have been retraced rather quickly, and you know, right now it looks like the market is holding on to this idea that Draghi isn't doing enough to push back against euro strength. There's been a little bit of a disconnect here where German yields haven't really moved higher, uh, and U.S. yields haven't broken down all that much, but the euro dollar has still moved significantly to the top side. I mean, it highlights the divergence between interest rate differentials and what's been going on with euro dollar. The blue line now here on the chart is the U.S. German two-year yield spread, which if euro dollar was trading closer to it, as it had done throughout all of last year and coming into the beginning of this year, uh, we'd be trading closer to 105. So I, I would think that right now, given the fact that the euro has rallied so much, that we are in the area where now this is a problem for the euro with respect to its achieving its inflation goals. Um, euro uh, right now is expected to end 2017 at 108 per the ECB's forecasts, and it's trading up at 116.47. We're talking about an excess of 8% above the ECB's preferred level. It's going to have a material impact on inflation, probably about 0.2 or 0.3% lower than what other ways might have been if it was trading at 108 by the end of this year. That means the ECB is likely to delay withdrawal or, or the pace of withdrawal of their stimulus program. Um, if anything, that can mean delay in the pace in which they taper. That could be something to look out for in the near term. Maybe September they punt on tapering because of how strong the euro is. They don't want to give in indication to the market that they are going to be hyper aggressive with tapering, even though really they're not indicating that they will be, but that's how the market seems to be interpreting it by what all this euro strength is. I also think part of the reason we're seeing some euro strength is because the political risk has just been zapped out of the euro area. Uh, between the Dutch elections and the French elections uh, turning out where the populist far right wing candidate were defeated, and uh, Gert uh, Wilders in uh, Holland and then Marie Le Pen in France. Uh, now September, German elections look like it's going to be a landslide for Merkel. This Merkel-Macron uh, tandem seems to be poised to lead Europe into a, a new era of, uh, you know, closer union. The Euro has been benefiting from a number of negative storylines being unwound and pretty much flipping on their head this year. From the ECB looking like they could ease more and dire concerns over Europe's future to now the ECB withdrawing stimulus and political concerns being well in the rearview mirror. Um, so your dollar this week, I, I think right now, if the dollar is able to catch a, a little bit of a bid after Wednesday, um, we're starting to get a little frosty here in terms of uh, the altitude, although I will say the technicals don't really give us a point at which we could say it's a comfortable entry point looking south just yet. So I would be watching this. Let's get some of these lines off the chart here. Obviously, this is not what I want. Uh, uh, I would look for the euro, you know, kind of finishing the rally sometime soon. That's kind of the feeling I'm getting right now in this market here. I know it's been persistent to the upside, but it's been a low volume, slow grind higher. Uh, I'm inclined to think that given these levels, the ECB is going to start to come out and change their tune. And Draghi wasn't hawkish last week, so uh, I think there's a point in time where he's going to need to step it up and then he's going to recognize that, apparently suggesting that having the ability to ramp back up QE if necessary did not spook markets. And I think there's actually some valid reason why between issue limits and capital key uh, restrictions, the ECB is going to be running into implementation issues soon, you know, if not by the end of this year, some point next. The fact of the matter is the way the ECB implements its QE program is what's under the, known as this capital key ratio. Capital key ratio is based on, uh, based on a weighted average of a country's population and their overall GDP contribution to the broader Eurozone GDP, which means a country like Germany naturally is the largest population country and the largest GDP country. 
has the largest capital key ratio. Any given month, they get about 17% of all ECB asset purchases. The problem is right now that because so much German debt is yielding below the acceptable threshold for the ECB to purchase it at, um, which was a you know a big deal, the ECB has in practice run out of eligible debt to buy under its QE program. So because it's constrained by this capital key ratio and because there simply won't be enough debt out there for them to uh, satiate their appetite right now at their current pace, they either have to A, relax the capital key ratio constraints, which they're not going to do, so B, they're forced to taper. So I think the market says, yes, Draghi, you may be threatening us with another rinse higher in the QE program. We know that you're concerned about inflation. You say that you may or may not taper, but the facts of the matter are that you have a program that is unsustainable. You're going to have to taper no matter what you say, and so the euro is being pushed higher by this. We'll see what Draghi has up his sleeves. Uh, but with the Fed this week, policy statement in focus. Let's see if they start the implementation of their balance sheet wind down. They may wait until one of these press conference meetings to do so, but on the off chance that they do this week, it could be a, just a wake-up call to the market, to investors who have been pricing in a hike starting in March 2018, maybe even June 2018, when the Fed's been saying otherwise. Now, that could be a real big boon for the dollar, which really has had everything go wrong. And someone actually said in the comments here, which I love, it's been a Murphy's Law year for the dollar, huh? I agree completely. Murphy's Law is the idea that you know if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. Something's bound to go wrong. And for the dollar this year, if it was fiscal stimulus, nothing on that end under the Trump administration. If it was monetary stimulus, Fed's been forced to uh, slow down their projected you know, past cycle. Market certainly priced it out a good deal. And then finally, um, you have actual economic performance, and the economy has been anything but stellar. 1.4% growth in Q1 looking at a meager improvement to 2.5 percent, which is good. It's not great. Prefer above 3 percent for real substantial improvement along the lines of inflation and labor, but um, 2.5 percent in this new normal, I suppose we'll have to do, as it were. Dollar yen this week around the Fed could be rather volatile, and I say that because Fed obviously has a chance to move U.S. yields, and U.S. yields have been falling, which is why, in part, dollar yen has been falling back. Dollar yen right now is still within the throes of its decline from the high that we saw back on July 11th, and actually, since then, we've only had two up days in the market. So it's been a pretty dire stretch here for dollar yen. I would keep an eye on dollar yen right now as it goes down into this support area, roughly between 110.65 and about 109.90. And I say that because we have this rising trend line from the recent swing low area back in April and beginning of June. And likewise, this former area in the chart that produced a number of highs and lows had come up back between February and June 2016. And once again, has been an area of interest a number of times over the last several months here. Um, this is the lower part of that range. Dollar yen should be watched in tandem with what's going on in gold because gold in the end tend to move in tandem and gold is making a significant effort higher right now. Gold's not only challenging the swing high that we had here on June 23rd up at one, excuse me, 1258.99, but it's also challenging this declining trend line that you see cutting across here from way back to the July 2016 highs. But it's important to give credit where credit to do because this trend line actually extends a lot further back. You have to go back to the September 2011 and the September 2012 highs, the, actually the all-time high we had back in September 2011. You take that trend line and you draw it all the way down. You know what? That's what we're intersecting with right here this week. Those trend lines that were coming off the highs we had in July 2016 intersect with the September 2011 and 12 trend lines, and we're trading right back to those trend lines this week. So I, I would say that this week, if dollar yen breaks down further from here and gold catches a bid, it's a really important to see if gold is able to sustain a breakout because if it is able to do so, that bodes very, very poorly for dollar yen. And dollar yen right now coming into support, if gold is able to break higher, then maybe that means that support in dollar yen won't hold. So I think it's important to watch these two in tandem this week. 
I look for what's going on in U.S. yields. If U.S. yields stabilize and start to turn higher, the odds of a gold breakout, of course, move down significantly, and therefore dollar again likely to find that support. I would look at the two in tandem. But again, gold technically pulling up above the eight, now above the 13, just getting above the 21 there, now all in line. MACD trending higher, but not above its median line yet, and stochastics trending higher, but not above 50 yet. It's kind of the same situation in dollar yen, right, where MACD is trending lower, but not quite below signal line, and stochastics trending lower, but not quite below 50. So momentum isn't firmly there yet to the downside for dollar yen or to the upside for gold, and as such, we'll watch these significant levels of resistance and support in each pair. Same thing for US GDP on Friday as we skip ahead just real quick because as you see we're running out of time and Friday US GDP expected to go back up to 2.5%. I think anything that shows 2.5% or more would be a welcome relief right now for the dollar which has really just been in a terrible spot uh, uh, data wise. Um, US economic surprise index, uh, city economic surprise index just coming off of its lowest levels in six years. Uh, momentum has been really weak. Likewise, medium-term inflation expectations are just off of their yearly lows. Hasn't been a good situation for the dollar. So anything that just breathes a little bit of relief into the situation, good for the greenback, good for the buck overall. U.S. yields are able to move up, but the 10-year yield is able to break its downtrend. That's where the dollar can really start to gain some more traction. Uh, the, the theme du jour, if you will, or at least uh, you know maybe de semaine, if we're going to talk about a theme of the week, um, we could say that it's been this idea that yields have been going up because central banks are threatening to tighten. If it's the Fed, if it's the ECB, if it's the BOE, if it's the BOC. Uh, we've seen a number of developed economies, central banks, talk about withdrawing stimulus, uh, really speaking up the relationship between wages and employment. A lot of faith in that Phillips curve relationship, that lower unemployment rates will produce higher inflation readings vis-a-vis -vis wages. And so any signs this week that you know, data has stabilized, that the Fed is reaffirming its commitment to uh, reaffirming its commitment to raising rates and normalizing its balance sheet, maybe wakes the market back up and helps the dollar stop the bleeding. And really that's what's been going on. DXY has been bleeding out the last few weeks, ever since June twenty seventh, once it became clear healthcare reform was pretty much dead, which of course you know, kill the hopes of tax reform and infrastructure spending reform. Um, seeing here, few pairs haven't covered. Yes, we talked about Aussie yen earlier. We didn't talk about CAD yen. CAD yen still at a very significant level, something that we've had on our radar now for the last few weeks. This uh, 88, 90 or so area support on a closing basis back in August 2015. September 2015, December 2015, once we broke down through there, immediate resistance, April 2016, December 2016, and here now, July 2017. It could be an inverse head and shoulders pattern. Very possible that this major bottoming effort is forming. You know, downtrend in price, sideways trade, head and shoulders. I'm going to be pointing for a very, very significant move higher up in the neighborhood of uh, perhaps above 100. I, I think the swing highs that we saw back in June 2015 could be acceptable right around 101 uh, as a target if that were to break out. But um, in any case, this week we're seeing that prices still have yet to make that crack through there. Uh, a lot of tests of that level, but no weekly close through it just yet. Right now, price has been supported by the 13 EMA, something that we've been supported by since June 12th. MACD and stochastic still in bullish territory, although no longer trending higher. Not really a surprise here as prices started to relax. We've been moving sideways for the past two and a half, three weeks now. Um, overall, I think the CAD is something that should be watched closely here. If we do get a close below the daily 13 EMA, that would be a bit of a warning sign that yen strength may continue. Uh, but if we're able to hold up here the next few days, find a base, I ultimately would be looking for continuation upwards. Uh, yen in a world where rates are going up, if we see that the Fed you know, reinvigorates this belief that they're going to hike this year and starts pushing out those interest rate differentials, um, the yen as a currency whose central bank just pushed back their inflation target, a very dovish move, 
is inherently pinned lower. And so our world of rising interest rate differentials, the yen does not have any ammunition in and is the weakest man in the block. I, I think that <clears throat> cad yen would be definitely be a place to look higher. Still, again, no breakout yet, but it should be on your radar this week given how tentative things are. Be patient. The thing about trading during the summer is during these lower volume times, these lower liquidity times is, you know, the moves, while they tend to follow through, they take more time to play out, okay? So you have to be patient. If this was March or if it was September or it was November or February, totally different conversation. But last week of July going into August, you're talking about some of the lowest volume of the year. And you know when equity markets are at all-time highs, people tend to step away from their desk more because their 401ks are doing great. They don't have a lot of concerns. They're feeling financially secure. Markets tend to dry up a little bit. Okay, um, speaking of the yen, backtracking for a brief moment, we have Japanese CPI on Thursday, not expected to be anything significant, 0.4% year over year, well below the 2% target. I think that if you have this hawkish Fed this week and you have this weak inflation data out of Japan, all of a sudden you get the mix where all, uh, where all some of the market's talking about interest rate differentials moving back up, as I stated previously, um, you know. Fed moving faster than BOJ, BOJ not moving at all, Dalian could easily find some support here. And if that's the case, if Dalian does find support, then gold probably not going to be able to break out um, as we approach this significant trend line here going back to those September 2011 and 2012 highs. All right. Um, with that said, though, that is it for me today. I've been going on for about 40 minutes now. My colleague Michael Boutros does need to get onto the microphone for his webinar this morning. If you're looking for more short-term trade setups, uh, more about what's going on today and tomorrow, Turn to Michael Boutrous's webinar. He's a scalper, so he's looking at you know five-minute hourly candles. I look at daily, weekly, so we operate on different time frames. Uh, he is more tuned with the short-term trader or scalper, if you will. Uh, I would point out that this week I do have a number of other webinars coming up. You can always find them by flipping on over to the calendar section on the top banner of the website, hitting that webinars calendar week uh, link. Tomorrow we're going to be doing an overview for U.S. economic data, so we'll be starting with the U.S. confidence report. Uh, uh, 9.45 Eastern, 13.45 GMT. You can always register for that by heading on over to that link and scheduling for it ahead of time. We'll be talking about FOMC as well on Wednesday and U.S. GDP on Friday. We also have durable goods and trade balance on Thursday for the U.S. economy. Uh, on Wednesday, doing a little bit of a FOMC precursor. Again, 6 Eastern, 10 GMT in the morning, the trading Q&A. Uh, Thursday, Central Bank Weekly, we'll be talking about the FOMC in retrospect and how to prepare for the end of the week, uh, and that's it for me over the coming days. Beyond that, if you want to get in touch with me via the Daily FX Real-Time News Feed, Stock Twitch, and Twitter, you may do so at CBEC UFX. You can access the Real-Time News Feed by hitting the News banner at the top of the website, hitting on Real-Time News. We'll bring you there. Analysis, articles, webinars, strategies, charts from myself, the other analysts, other items that may be of interest to you as you make your way through your trading day. Beyond that, you can always email me, cvecchio at dailyeffects.com. I really appreciate your time and attention this morning. Good luck trading the next few days. Hopefully, I will see you tomorrow. If not, uh, make it Wednesday. Beyond that, good luck. Again, appreciate your time and attention.